Well, hello, everyone. I'm uh, uh, George Benjo, and I'm the executive director here at the American Public Health Association, and we're very excited that you're here with us today uh, as we kick off National Public Health Week for uh, 2014. As you know, uh, National Public Health Week is celebrated each year as a full first full week in April uh, as an opportunity for us to galvanize um, our nation uh, around the issues of public health prevention and wellness. Um, this year our theme is uh, public health start here, um, which this is basically just an opportunity for us to tell people that there are many, many, many challenges that we have in health today uh, and the best way for us to, to get it done is just to start doing it. Uh, so we have um, each day dedicated to a different topic. We, um, day one today is be healthy from the start. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, both our forum today and maternal child health, school nutrition, emergency preparedness, all the broad activities we think about uh, in uh, health and public health. Uh, tomorrow to focus on don't panic, uh, which is our way to get people to think about preparedness and disaster preparedness, uh, particularly as we start um, our spring storm community. Um, get out ahead. I'm trying to think about prevention and wellness as a way of uh, getting ahead of illness um, and injury. Uh, eating well on day four, Thursday, to talk about good nutrition. Um, and then, of course, uh, a theme that APHA is really planning to champion over the next several years, and that is to recognize that our nation, despite spending enormous amounts of money on health, uh, we're not the healthiest nation. And the idea is for us to begin to start a movement starting today, um, certainly to be the healthiest nation. Uh, and we think we can do that in the next generation. We think that's a very, very important uh, point to, to get to. There are several other things that are going to happen today. Obviously, we have um, um, this um, webinar today. Uh, in addition, we have uh, a webinar on the leading health indicators tomorrow uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Howard Cole, will also be part of that uh, process. Um, we have a Twitter chat on Wednesday, um, and just to let you know, we're also tweeting today, so the hashtag is hashtag NPHW uh, for National Public Health Week. That's hashtag NPHW, and we want people to also tweet. Um, we have about um, uh, 50 people or so here in the room, and we have over 400 people uh, out there in cyberspace. So this is a, a very good showing um, um, for, for this, uh, this kickoff. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to have a teletown hall on air pollution and public health. Um, and I think that's going to be a very important town hall where we have the EPA Administrator um, Jenny McCarthy uh, and, again, Dr. Cole representing the Department of Health and Human Services. On Thursday, we're going to talk about um, a webinar on food justice, obesity, and the social determinants of health where our president, um, the APHA president, will be there and other health experts um, to talk about the issue of um, food insecurity, um, proper nutrition. And then on Friday, we're going to have a Google Hangout on active transportation, recognizing that most of what makes us healthy each and every day occurs long before you get to the doctor's office. Um, so with that introduction, um, I, I'd like to um, bring um, to the podium our keynote speaker, uh, who's a good friend. Um, I, I've known um, Dr. Howard Cole, who's the Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, since both of us served as state health officials. Um, Dr. Cole um, did a, a marvelous job. He was one of our national champions um, on tobacco control. Um, he ran a very strong department um, with a lot of very progressive um, things that the department did. Um, so when he was elevated to the post of the Assistant Secretary, certainly none of us were surprised because of the marvelous work he had done um, back home. And then when he left that job, of course, he went to um, Harvard University where he served uh, in a very, very important um, public health role um, as, I think, Associate Dean. Um, for public health there and, and, and really was there to try to get the practice element um, at the Harvard School um, really churned up. Now in his role as the Assistant Secretary, he oversees um, several offices. There are 12 core public health officers that he oversees, including the Office of the Surgeon General and the U U.S. Public Health Service Corps, the regional health officers around the nation, 
the 10 Presidential and Secretary Advisory Committees. He serves as the Senior uh, Public Health Advisor to the Secretary of the Department. And for many years, as I said, he's been dedicated to um, this concept of better health at lower costs. Um, so with that introduction, I'd like to bring to the podium my good friend, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. Howard Coe. Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin, for that very warm welcome. And I'm absolutely delighted to join you today for this kickoff for the National Public Health Week. And let me start by thanking Georges Benjamin. There's so many people in public health who are so dedicated for so long, but I don't think anybody matches Dr. Benjamin's record for perseverance and dedication. So a big round of applause for Georges Benjamin here. I'm delighted to be representing Secretary Kathleen Sebelius and my 80,000 colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services today. I'm very pleased to have a colleague from our communications department, Diana Kassar Yule, who is a public health colleague and also a future public health graduate student. So Diana, thank you for joining us here. But I want to start by thanking each and every one of you for celebrating National Public Health Week and for making public health your vocation and or your avocation. Because by being here and by promoting public health, you are standing for something. And that's a wonderful mission that we all share. My wonderful friend, the late Reverend William Sloan Coffin, liked to say, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And in public health, we stand together. We stand for the health of our families and our friends. We stand for the health of our neighborhoods and our communities. We stand for the health of our nation and indeed the world. And we have a common mission of helping all people reach their full potential for health because we know that our good health is a gift and it needs to be protected day in and day out. And the best way to do that is to build the best system of public health possible. In short, the goal here is not to help people just survive, but thrive. It was Maya Angelou who said, to survive is important, but to thrive is elegant. That could be our public health mission statement, if you will. And the timing of this week and this kickoff session is very important because it gives us an opportunity to reflect and to reaffirm our sense of mission and to renew our resolve for building a stronger public health and making our nation as healthy as possible. Now you all know and we all know that we are working right now within a fragmented health and healthcare system in this country. As Dr. Benjamin pointed out, we have the most expensive system in the world, but we don't have the outcomes to match. And I have up close and personal experience with this system as a physician and clinician and provider for over 30 years. I have lived this fragmentation as all of you have as providers and as patients. We have right now primarily a fee for service system that rewards volume, not necessarily value. We have a fragmented system that doesn't pay enough attention to quality and outcomes. We have a system that doesn't pay enough attention to prevention and public health and protecting that gift. And so we have too often people suffering preventable suffering and dying preventable death in our society and that has got to change. So we have in short today a fragmented sick care system, not really a health care system. And our vision for this week and beyond is to build a true system for health healthcare and prevention and public health that protects that gift for each person day in and day out. So what's our vision for a healthier future? How do we create the healthiest nation? How do we build better systems for prevention and public health? First, we have to remind ourselves what the definition of health is. That's a fun exercise for all of us. And one of my favorite de definitions comes from the World Health Organization. 
that defines health as, quote, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, unquote. I love that definition because it's all-inclusive and it joins the body and the soul and our social environment. It gets to the heart of what wellness is all about, not just disease prevention. And that should be a source of inspiration for us going forward, just defining health that way. And then how do we know if our country is getting healthier over time? Well, we have a number of ways to do that, but one of our most time-honored processes is the healthy people process that's now into its fourth decade. And each decade, healthy people provides a comprehensive set of science-based goals and objectives for improving the health of all Americans. We are now about a third of the way to Healthy People 2020. I like to say that we need 2020 vision for a healthier future. And if you have revisited the overarching goals for a Healthy People 2020, there are four of them. First, to improve quantity and quality of life, because after all, public health adds years to all of our lives and quality of life to all of our years. Second, we want, we want to eliminate health disparities. We want all people to enjoy what Martin Luther King has called the sunlight of opportunity. I love that phrase. Third, we want public health to adopt a lifespan approach. So we talk about prevention and public health from the beginning of life through the end of life, from the day you are born, literally. And fourth, in the 21st century, we want to build the best surroundings possible so that the healthy choice is the easier choice. And that's where the so-called social determinants of health come in. Hopefully all of you know that Healthy People 2020 has a small set of high priority health issues called the leading health indicators. They represent high priority health issues and actions that can make a major difference for our society. These leading health indicators were selected and organized according to a conceptual framework that addresses the overall determinants of health for each and every one of us by life stage. So for example, we know that having a healthy environment is critically important for health outcomes. That's why we have a leading health indicator on environmental quality. We know that healthcare is important for our overall wellness. That's why we have leading health indicators related to access to care and clinical preventive services like immunization, colorectal cancer screening, and hypertension control. We know determinants of health have to do with traditional public health arenas like maternal and child health, tobacco control, reproductive and sexual health, knowing your HIV zero status, for example. And then in this era where we're trying to talk about health in all of its totality, we have a leading health indicator related to oral health and very importantly, mental health and substance abuse services because you can't have your health unless you have complete physical, mental, and social well-being. That's the World Health Organization definition. And then we are in an era of the social determinants because we know, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned, that health is much more than what happens to you in a doctor's office. In fact, health starts where people live, labor, learn, play, and pray. I made that up, so I'll say that again. <laughs> Health starts where people live, labor, learn, play, and pray. And that's why one of our leading health indicators has to do with educational attainment, the percentage of people across the United States who receive their high school diploma four years after starting ninth grade. So focusing on the Healthy People 2020 leading health indicators gives us a chance to promote a comprehensive view of health, improve the quality of life for all Americans, rearticulate the goal of protecting the gift of health for all Americans. And as Dr. Benjamin mentioned, tomorrow he and I and others will be on a webinar that joins HHS and APHA uh, two o'clock tomorrow as we release a leading health indicator progress report to demonstrate that even though we're only a third of the way through healthy people to 2020, only a third of the way through the decade, we can document some progress already in some of these key indicators. So please stay tuned. Now, another reason why the timing of this conference and this week is so critically important is that a week ago, we finished the first open enrollment period for the Affordable 
Care Act. And we are so grateful to each and every one of you for supporting the aims and the hopes and the dreams of the Affordable Care Act, because this offers the promise of a better system for health for the future. Not just better systems of insurance, which has gotten most of the attention, but also the promise of better care and better public health. In fact, when I am asked to explain the Affordable Care Act in one line, I say it offers the promise of better insurance, better care, and better public health. And we are now in an active national dialogue about how to build better systems to reach those outcomes. Let me comment on those three subparts very quickly. First, better insurance. You know that we've had a very fragmented health insurance system, if it's a system at all, where millions of people have been locked out, have not been able to obtain insurance coverage. Many of these people have been sick or had pre-existing conditions. But now, in 2014, we can say because of the Affordable Care Act, everyone has access to coverage, regardless of whether you have a pre-existing condition or not. No one can be turned away. And as of midnight last Monday, 7.1 million people have signed up for insurance through marketplaces in all 50 states, whether they're state-based or federally facilitated. We have already celebrated 3.1 million young adults under age 26 gaining new coverage on their parents' plans. Nearly 12 million people eligible for Medicaid and CHIP. And just a couple hours ago, a Gallup poll was released, hopefully you have seen it, showing that the rates of uninsured in this country dropped from 17.1% at the end of 2013 to 14.7% in the second half of March of this year. And in fact, right now we are having a uninsurance rate of under 15% for the first time since 2008. So hopefully we have started a very important system for health insurance coverage. Thank you to all of you for your support and your leadership and passion on this issue. We cannot stop until we have just about everybody covered in this country and people have the insurance they need and deserve. I'm a physician, so I've seen time and again through my clinical career what happens when you're caring for patients without insurance. They're so concerned and distracted about the fragility of their insurance coverage, they can barely concentrate on getting better they can barely concentrate on the illness before them. Those days hopefully are gone, and we can give everybody security and peace of mind so that they can focus on getting better or staying well and achieving their highest potential for health. The second theme I mentioned was better care through the Affordable Care Act, and we need systems that reward outcomes and value, not just volume. We need better systems for care in this day and age where people are living longer, but not necessarily living better. And as we age, many of us are at risk for not only one health condition, but multiple chronic conditions. And we have a health system that's so fragmented, we shuttle patients around from one doctor's office to the next, and it's hard to, to have the patient feel like they're being cared for in their totality. So under the rubric of the Affordable Care Act, we now have attention to new models for coordinated care that are team-based. Hopefully you've all heard about accountable care organizations that now cover about 10% of Medicare beneficiaries. Hopefully you've heard about patient-centered medical homes that have been heavily adopted by our community health centers, for example, have an emphasis on team-based approaches and quality outcomes. Now these are all in the very early phase of implementation, still needs strong evaluation, but at least we are in a period of public health history where we're talking about building better systems of care, especially for people with multiple chronic conditions. That probably includes all of us. And so we need to accelerate that conversation moving forward. And we need that conversation about systems of better care, especially since our country is getting more diverse than the minute, but by the minute. And here's an issue of health disparities that I have lived through personally, not just professionally, uh, as a Korean American whose parents immigrated to this country a generation ago searching for the American, the American dream. We need to recognize that our country is getting more diverse by the minute, and we need a system 
that ensures that all Americans have access to care that's culturally and linguistically appropriate. In fact, in this room a year ago, I was delighted to join my colleague, Dr. Nadine Gracia, the director of our Office of Minority Health, and many others in the public health community to unveil the enhanced so-called CLASS standards, the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services in Health in Healthcare. I'd like to say we need to deliver and advance health with CLASS. That's what the CLASS standards are all about. And can we encourage all organizations involved in health and health care, whether it's direct service or prevention and public health, to guide their providers and organizations to implement culturally and linguistically appropriate services. If we can do that, that'll advance health equity, improve quality, and hopefully make a contribution to reducing disparities. So thank you for your support of that. Uh, we need this discussion about better care for diverse populations as we go forward. And then, of course, the big theme that everybody here is particularly excited about, I'm sure, building better systems of prevention and public health. The Affordable Care Act allows that in many ways for individuals, for communities, and the entire nation. For individuals now, we are very aware that even moderate copays deter, deter many people from accessing high-value preventive services. So again, under the Affordable Care Act, we remove cost as a barrier so people can access mammograms and colorectal cancer screening, uh, hepatitis vaccines, screening for cervical cancer, smoking cessation services without concern about extra costs. And as of right now, we can say that because of the Affordable Care Act, over 100 million people have now access these high-value preventive services without concerns over cost. We had 71 million through private plans, some 34 million in Medicare who are accessing new uh, wellness visits. So we want that momentum to continue as well. We want people to access high-value preventive services, and we are hoping that we can show sooner rather than later that they are, are making a difference. You know, at the community and national level, we have a new prevention and public health fund that's now going into its fifth year, a budget of about a billion dollars a year. None of us take this for granted because funding prevention remains very, very difficult. But this fund has already allowed communities to advance concepts of prevention in areas like tobacco control, obesity prevention, and elimination of health disparities. It's also brought new partners to the table, non-traditional partners from areas like housing, education, and transportation, advancing the so-called social determinants approach. So we want that to continue with your passion and your dedication and your leadership, and we think that's building better systems of prevention and public health. Now let me make a couple more comments on two specific areas of prevention. The first is tobacco control, and 2014 has already been a big year for this area. Hopefully you all know that in January we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the release of the landmark 1964 Surgeon General's report on cigarette smoking and health. So 50 years later, we can celebrate much progress. We've had a great drop in smoking prevalence among adults and also youth. We've had some 8 million preventable deaths averted because of tobacco control efforts of many of you in this room and around the country. But lurking behind this progress is a major potential challenge, and that is the misperception that's out there among far too many that somehow this problem is solved and it's time to move on to something else. And let me, let me assure you, nothing could be further from the truth. When you have a addiction that still unfortunately affects some 42 million people in this country, nearly half a million preventable deaths a year due to tobacco. When you have a situation where the burden of tobacco use is falling heavily on lower income people, on sexual minorities, on people with mental health and some substance abuse issues, the disparities issues are particularly disconcerting here in the tobacco control world. Uh, we have cigarettes now that are more addictive now than ever before. That was one of the conclusions of the 50th anniversary report. And each year, even now, we have some 14 billion cigarettes consumed by the American public. 
with each cigarette being a finely designed nicotine delivery device. And one of the most disturbing conclusions of the 50th anniversary report was that some 5.6 million youth alive today will die prematurely because of tobacco dependence. So this is a time, National Public Health Week, to refresh ourselves about the urgency of this pressing public health catastrophe, is the way I would summarize it, that we have some opportunities with the 50th anniversary release to uh, reinvigorate our commitment to ending this epidemic. In February, uh, I was very pleased to join many high-level offici officials, including the FDA commissioner, to unveil their new youth prevention campaign entitled The Real Cost. And this is aimed at some 10 million at-risk youth who are thinking about or are possibly experimenting with tobacco to make prevention come alive for that group. We also have the third iteration of the CDC's very effective Tips from Former Smokers campaign that's hit the media since 2012, so we're very proud of that. And the Surgeon General's report also suggests that we can start talking about what are termed end game strategies. How could we talk about the end of this epidemic once and for all? Two strategies to put before you. One is to, con to consider lowering, lowering the nicotine content in cigarettes to a level that's non-addictive. Can, can we do that in an era where FDA has new regulatory authorities? That's something that's being actively discussed. And second, can we encourage greater restrictions on sales? And a great example of that was in February when CVS Caremark announced that by fall, they're going to be stopping selling all tobacco products in their 7,600 outlets from coast to coast. So please join us in discussing how to make these end game strategies really come alive. That's what this 50th anniversary time is all about. How do we end this epidemic once and for all? Hopefully all of you agree that it shouldn't take another 50 years. Our goal is to relegate the tobacco epidemic to the history books, just as we have done with smallpox. So another area of prevention, just to show you how broad this area has become for all of us, has to do with climate change. And Dr. Benjamin mentioned that on Wednesday, we are having a teletown hall with the EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, who is a wonderful public health leader. In fact, you may or may not know that she started her career as a local public health official in Massachusetts. So she has a strong public health background, a strong environmental background, of course, has been a great leader for us in climate change related activities and environmental protection. Right now, with active discussion about climate change, we are particularly concerned, once again, about the most vulnerable among us, kids, elderly, those living in poverty. And it reminds us of the statement that's on the wall of the Humphrey Building where I work on Independence Avenue. If you walk into the lobby of HHS, you will see a picture, a portrait of the former Vice President Hubert Humphrey. And he has a statement there saying, that we should all be concerned about protecting people in the dawn of life, in the twilight of life, and in the shadows of life. Those themes relate to climate change and so many others, other areas of public health. This past June of 2013, the President personally unveiled a climate action plan with major goals to redu reduce carbon production, to improve resilience, and then to engage the whole global community and there were two health-related initiatives announced as part of that action plan. First, to make sure that we put out a resource packet that educates all healthcare facilities about how they can best become climate resilient. You know that in Hurricane Sandy, we had some major New York hospitals closed down for months, and we want a society where the healthcare facilities are the last to go down in an environmental disaster in this era of climate change, not one of the first. And there are also uh, initiatives to support CDC's efforts to educate state and local public health leaders about the health impacts of climate change and a series of guidances coming out. So that's work that's ongoing and we're very, very proud of that. As I end this presentation, let me talk a little bit about some innovative strategies for building better systems that are coming out of our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Again, because of the Affordable Care Act, a new 
center was created at CMS, the Innovation Center. And this is a center that's asking for proposals from the outside about how to promote health better, not just for some people, but for all people. Healthcare Innovation Awards have been put out, I believe, this week. The second round of awardees is being announced. And improving population health has been a major category of submissions to test new care delivery and payment models. So please track that carefully if you haven't already. The CMS Innovation Center wants proposals to improve population health, but also to decrease cost and improve return on investment. Another example of this commitment is through the State Innovations Model Initiative, SIM. And this is one way of asking states to bring their healthcare leaders and their prevention and public health leaders together and say, can you improve the entire population's health, not just the people sitting in this clinic or that clinic? Can we join the clinic and the community can we improve overall population health in areas like health disparities, mental health, substance abuse? Can we build accountable health communities, not just accountable care organizations, but accountable health communities? That's a term that's being used a lot by our Innovation Center leaders. So as I finish, I want to thank you. This is a very exciting time to think of how we can build the systems that's going to make our country healthier, if not the healthiest nation in our generation. One of the challenges but excitements of our field is that human health is never a finished product. There's always work to do. But you have been part of this journey. It is an indescribable journey. It's a historic journey in the era of health reform. There's a wonderful saying that I often quote, that everyone journeys to an end. But in the end, what matters is the journey. And we have shared that experience as now, especially over recent months and years. And more than anything, sessions like this, the National Public Health Week, give us a sense of hope for the future. It was Martin Luther King who said, he who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. And you're bringing us much health and hope during an absolutely historic time. So thank you very, very much for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think delighted? Dr. Koh has a couple moments for a couple questions. Yes, sir. Samuel Cooper. Uh, what is the strategy of the administration in addressing the issues involving those who fall through the gap, uh, those who don't have enough to pay for even affordable health care insurance, um, and are not eligible for uh, uh, Medicare, and mostly in rural areas and in, in other parts of the country? Okay, great, great question. So, of course, the initial dream was to have Medicaid expansion in every state, and right now we have that in only 26 states. You know, so we want to encourage Medicaid expansion in the remaining states, and we're, we're hoping that over time the, the remaining states will see the progress that the, the initial round of adopting states has, has made. Uh, you all know that with Medicaid expansion, the initial dollars that go into that expansion are 100 percent covered by the federal government and never go below 90 percent in the future, so that's very important. And relevant to your question, sir, we also still need a strong safety net, a strong systems so that people do not fall through the cracks. So uh, we've had a huge investment in our community health centers, actually both in the Bush administration and now the Obama administration. So the community health centers are building up new access points, um, and they are really leaders in patient-centered medical homes, as I've already noted. And so that's a place for anybody and everybody to get care if they can't get it through uh, the, the marketplace or Medicaid expansion right now. So one of our challenges is to make sure that all these parts of the system work together so that ultimately we're giving everybody coverage, care, and public health that they need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coe. Uh, Doralina Sam is Posey from the Directors of Health Promotion and Education here in Washington, D.C. Um, being from a, a former head of the health, state health department, with the Affordable Care Act, 
what is going to now be the role of public health departments in things like breast and cervical cancer control health education health promotion that things we traditionally in the past or in the now moving into the future we had been providing the free screening services and all the education at the local health departments what is going to become the role now that we have affordable care okay great question and I think sort of related to this gentleman's question we need public health now more than ever before in my view first first of all the prevention and public health potential for the Affordable Care Act is still a well-known secret as far as I can tell we we've, we've been so publicly concerned about websites and about enrollment that we haven't really talked about the prevention and public health aspects yet so everybody here can be the, the leader in talking about that potential the, the need for better prevention the need for uh, the prevention fund to say say stable and strong uh, we need the state and local leaders in particular because that's where the action is I, I can say this as a former state health commissioner and uh, the best concrete way to answer your question uh, Dorlina is um, in Massachusetts when health reform went into effect in 2006 there was lots of transition about who was going to care for certain programs and how that new uh, system was going to work so public health really took the lead there which is why health reform in Massachusetts has, has gone so well although they've had some current issues with their website as some of you may know but in terms of coordinating the past and the future uh, and making sure that people don't fall through the crack it was, it was really Massachusetts public health leaders former Commissioner John Auerbach and others who, who were very vocal there so we're hoping that every public health leader at the state and local level can play that role in 2014 going forward. We have time for one more question if there is any more. There's actually a question that came in via Twitter. Okay. Um, the question actually comes from somebody at Sophie. How can we build a system to make our nation the healthiest nation? <laughs> so I think we, uh, in, in short, take full advantage of the potential of the Affordable Care Act in terms of building better systems of insurance, care, and prevention in public health. I think as time goes on, now we open enrollment has stopped as of a week ago. The next open enrollment starts in November. So this little window might be a good time to start really ramping up the discussions on better care uh, and then better prevention in public health and make sure that discussion on the future of the health of the country is, is balanced between those three areas in a um, very positive way. And again, this is where I believe APHA and the public health community can make the biggest contribution because the issues of the need for better care and better uh, models of care that, that uh, reward value, not just volume, the, the need for strong prevention of public health that's sustained over time and doesn't go up and down with every budget cycle is critically important and it's the leaders in this room who have lived it uh, who uh, understand it who understand the science it's great to see my colleague dr. Steve Wolf here who has advanced that science and that that's where we really need the prevention to come alive and that's that would be my final thought for all of you Dr. Cole, thank you very much thank you very much thank you Well, thank you. I, I'd like to bring the panel up. Um, that my two colleagues are coming up. Let me introduce them while they're while they're coming up. Um, as you know, we wanted to talk a bit today about um, this whole idea of systems transformation, which is very consistent with uh, the questions that we that we had uh, asked to Dr. Cole, uh, and we wanted Dr. Cole to kind of put this in the national perspective. Um, but we also have two other national leaders here with us. Um, on the, to my right, immediate right, is uh, Dr. Stephen Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf is the director of the Virginia Commonwealth University Center on so Society and Health and is professor of family medicine and population health at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, he got his MD from the Emory University and is a residency trained family physician. Um, he's also a clinical epidemiologist and um, with formal training in preventive medicine and public health for Johns Hopkins where he received his MPH in 1987 and he's board certified in family medicine and preventive medicine and public health. He's an author of over 150 articles 
um, really a very much a career looking at the whole range of population health um, with a lot of focus on uh, the social determinants and he's an elected member of the Institute of Medicine uh, when he was elected in 2001. Uh, to his right is um, Mr. Brian Carducci. Brian is a Chief Program and Strate uh, Strategy Officer at the De Beaumont Foundation. Um, but Brian directs the Foundation's grant-making activities and contributes to the strategic de design there at the Foundation. Um, he is very, very much a public health practitioner. Uh, he spent uh, over a decade in governmental public health at the state and local level. Um, he's done some stints at the Philadelphia Department of Health, the, de the Texas Department of State Health Services, and the Georgia Department of Health. And throughout his career in public health, he has worked to create synergy between public health research and practice. Um, he's very much focused, and I've known Brian for some time, where he's really focused on the idea of making data-driven decisions. Uh, he has a strong interest in maternal child health. Um, he graduated summa cum laude with a BA in political science from North Carolina uh, State University in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1997, and graduated with a Master's of Art degree from Columbia University in New York uh, in 2006. So what we want to do is, is spend some time with our two real national experts here uh, with a much more detailed discussion uh, about this effort. So I'll get to the first question in just one moment. And just to remind you to speak, you need to have your, you don't need to cut your speakers on. So with that, let me, um, the way we wanted to conduct the panel, um, we have um, several questions, and what I thought I would do is, is ask those questions and then ask our, our colleagues here um, to, to give us kind of their thoughts. So the first topical area is the state of the American's health system um, and what should the, some of the first steps towards being the healthiest nation um, are and where, should, where are we right now, with the first question being, um, if they could each give me a brief description of what they've been doing, um, fundamentally through their organizations to address this whole issue of health systems transformation. And I'll start with Dr. Wolf. Thank you, uh, Georges. Um, <clears throat> I direct a center at uh, my un university, Virginia Commonwealth University. The center is called the Center on Society and Health. And our work is very much focused on trying to raise public awareness about the health implications of factors outside of health care. This has been mentioned a couple of times already by Secretary Coe and Dr. Benjamin that uh, our health is shaped by health care, but the studies indicate it's probably about 10 percent of health outcomes that are determined by what happens in the doctor's office and the hospital, and that our health is really much shaped by the conditions in which we live, our socioeconomic conditions, neighborhood conditions, uh, our physical and social environment, and so forth. And our work is focused on trying to uh, engage the public, policymakers, and other stakeholders uh, to help them see the connections, to connect the dots uh, between these factors in health, and to uh, uh, give them appropriate priority, both in improving health outcomes and uh, controlling health care costs. Brian. Well, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Benjamin for the invitation to be here today. Um, what an, what an impressive panel and what a great opportunity to be here for National Public Health Week. So I'm with the De Beaumont Foundation, which some of you may not know. Um, we, are found, we were founded by uh, Pierre S. De Beaumont, who founded Brookstone. And he and our current CEO, Dr. James Sprague, said, we really need to form a foundation that can focus on boots on the ground public health that can really not, not look at the theoretical, but, but look at the practical. And what we know right now in public health is there's been an, an epidemiologic transition, right? Dr. Frieden noted this in his 2004, it's 10 years ago, his 2004 editorial asleep at the switch. We don't worry so much about you know, the, the communicable diseases. We don't worry as much about syphilis or we don't worry as much about polio, but that's been replaced by heart disease, and that's been replaced by diabetes. And, and here's the trick. When you really think about our health care achievements, it's been a drug or a treatment, something born in the lab. That's not going to work this time. There's no pill 
There is no vaccine that can really help the, the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables or the dis disproportionate distribution of alcohol and tobacco advertising in outlets in poor communities. Jonas Salk is not saving us this time. So we need to change our health care system. We need a different way of looking at it. Right now, you go in to a provider's office and you get some of the best care in the world with the best technologies and the best treatments. But then you return to a community that is antagonistic to all of that. We must work together. And that's why the De Beaumont Foundation, in coordination and partnership with our friends at uh, Duke University's Medical School's Department of Community and Family Health, uh, Community and Family Medicine, that's Dr. Lloyd Michener, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, Denise Koo, we developed the practical playbook, Public Health and Primary Care Together. We developed this because we all go to great meetings and we hear great keynote speakers like Howard Coe, right? We just heard Howard talk about some things that we could do. And all of us are thinking, well, when I go back to my office, I'm going to do it. I'm going to change how we do our work in our system. And unfortunately, when we get home tomorrow, we're going to go, I, I don't know how to do what he said. Mm -hmm. But the Practical Playbook is there to help. You can find it at www.practicalplaybook.org. And we developed it to do three things. We developed it to provide a conceptual background to primary care and public health integration for those who are unfamiliar with the concept, why it will work. We have outlined the necessary steps to establish collaborative relationships with healthcare and public health. And we have success stories. Because I know for me, the best way for me to do something is to see someone else who's done it. Because then if you did it, well, of course I can do it. And we present these success stories in the playbook. And it's really, a, the, the playbook is a tool, right? It's a companion for champions and leaders who understand that we need to work together public health and primary care together to really make achievements in health and health care in population health. The simple truth is that our traditional model of health care doesn't work anymore. We need new models to embrace this new era of disease and beat it like we've beat the others. Thanks, Brian. Um, so as we begin to approach uh, this whole issue of transformation, um, you know, there, there are lots of uh, challenges that we have in front of us and um, some opportunities. Um, what do you both see are these um, kind of these challenges and opportunities? Um, and let's, let's just say over the next three to five years. Steve. Well, uh, there's, that's a lot to cover. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, one of our first challenges is to broaden our thinking. Um, the uh, success we're going to achieve in improving public health is going to have to involve more than health care and even what we think of as traditional public health. Um, it really is going to involve a broad sector collaboration that goes beyond health and medicine to include the other sectors in education, the economy, community development, the business community, and others, uh, both at the national and state level, but also down at the local and community level, even the neighborhood level. And it's by building those partnerships and coalitions that we're really going to move the needle on uh, improving public health. Clearly, collaboration between my clinical colleagues and, and traditional governmental public health agencies is, is an important way forward. Um, but frankly, uh, the challenge that we face requires an even more extensive kind of uh, collaboration. I think uh, another major challenge that we have is not so much knowing what to do. Um, the practical playbook and, and other resources that are available, um, the uh, national uh, prevention strategy that the Department of Health and Human Services released a couple of years ago, and many other blue ribbon efforts have laid out for us some very clear evidence-based strategies that the nation can take uh, to address the health problem. So it's not so much knowing what to do, it's marshalling the resolve and resources to do it. Um, and in our current environment, that, that's a challenge. Um, I think uh, a major impediment, it's both a challenge and an opportunity, I think, is to raise public awareness about the scope of the problem. 
Uh, Howard Coe was a little generous when he said that we spend way more than other countries and don't have the results to match it. It's actually worse than this. Uh, I just uh, chaired a panel co-sponsored by the National Research Council and Institute of Medicine comparing the health of Americans with people in 16 other high-income countries. The report was released last year. And what it shows is, frankly, depressing. Um, Americans are sicker than people in other countries. We have shorter life expectancies, and this is not a new problem. It's been going on since the early 1980s, and it's getting progressively worse. We don't think Americans understand this. Uh, there is a general perception that we have the best health care system in the world, and even if people accept that that's not the case, they live with the misconception that we are the healthiest people in the world, and it's quite the contrary. Uh, Americans have shorter life expectancy than people in other high-income countries. How many parents in America know that a child is more likely to die before age five if it's an American child than if it's a child born in other high-income countries? Babies are, are, are less likely to reach their first birthday, and this is a true across different subgroups. It's not just for racial and ethnic minorities, all social classes. College-educated Americans die earlier than college-educated people in other country. Rich Americans die earlier than rich people in other high-income countries. So I think if we help Americans understand this evidence and the seriousness of the problem, uh, I think we might see a change in the resolve to do something about it. The other important uh, factor I'll mention, and then I'll be done on this, is, is the role of the business community. Um, while our government is sort of in a quagmire right now, the uh, corporate America is losing their shirts on the cost of health care and is beginning to understand the arguments about social determinants of health and seeing the business case for investing in these factors to improve the health of their workforce, to increase their workforce productivity, and ultimately to be more competitive against uh, employers in other countries who have healthier workforces and lower health care costs. So now you see the business community uh, paying attention to public health concerns and I think are potential partners in, in changing the dynamics of the conversation. So I am a chronic disease epidemiologist. And as a chronic disease epidemiologist, when you do surveillance, you recognize that many of our chronic disease surveillance systems, BRIFIS, YRBS, um, lack a, a geographic precision that we need. We don't get data at the census tract level. When you deal with your BRIFIS and, and YRBS and et cetera data, um, it's lagged by a good 18 months. So we lost some precision in public health when we moved from a acute disease model where things would go to a lab, you'd get the, 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 the addresses back, you had those data, to a chronic disease model. We've lost precision. So I want to take us back to about 12 months ago. It's April 2013. Several states announced triumphantly that childhood obesity was on the decline. And that's good, until you dig a little. That was 2013. Those data were from 2011 and only available at the state level. It's National Survey on Children's Health, done by HRSA. It was comparing a trend from 2007 to 2011. So for one of the most debilitating epidemics of our time, we're relying on data at the state level from two years ago. If I walked into my physician's office and said, I'd like some chemotherapy, he'd probably put me on a, on a mental health hold. He'd say, what do you mean you want some chemotherapy? Do you have cancer? I don't know. But I want some chemotherapy. Do you have any blood work? Absolutely. It's from two years ago. You wouldn't get care. But for our communities, we feel that's OK to be the standard. However, interestingly, the entire natural history of the obesity epidemic is in electronic health records and medical records throughout this country. Right? Every time you walk in to a clinician, if I go today to see my doctor, he's going to get my height and get my weight. And I go tomorrow, he's going to get my height and my weight again. And he's going to have my address. And he, we actually could, could see 
where the epidemic was starting, how it was growing, if we had just had access to those data. And so that to me is the biggest you know, opportunity we have, is how do we take data, healthcare data, and action it and from public health so that we can have real-time data to make real-time decisions. I imagine some of you invest in the stock market. If you were working with me and I was your investment consultant, and you said, I want to invest some, I just got a big bonus at work and I want to invest it. And I said, absolutely. Here's a company. And you look at that and you go, Brian, th these data are from two years ago. That's the most recent financials? Right. Invest today and we'll see how it goes. Now, if you'll make that investment, you come see me after because we'll talk. I can have a little side business and we make some money out of it. That's what we're doing in, in public health right now. You know, when you're a state health official, when you're a local health official and you look at your obesity data, you're actually looking two years ago. So how do, we, how do we make sure that we're using the available data through electronic medical records, which each takes a slice of our community, and there's no one who's looking at the pie, and that has to be our role in, in governmental public health, in our health departments. We have to see the whole perspective, and we can do that and work with our primary care partners and our business community and our faith community to say, this is the real burden of disease in our community right now. But as much as this is an opportunity, it is a major challenge because we are going to have to find ways to build relationships that can lead to data sharing. And, and this, just for me, is something that we must do. We must get our workforce ready. We must be ready as public health providers to engage with our partners, to look at these data and aggregate them and make them actionable. Just remember that right now, somewhere, you have four providers, each on a different EMR, and each are seeing four uncontrolled pediatric asthmatics. You can't see the 16 asthmatic cluster. It's not visible to us. If it was, we'd investigate it. We'd find that those 16 kids go to the same school. We'd investigate a little further, find those 16 kids ride the same school bus. We'd go check that bus. Guess what? There's a cracked tailpipe. I took a 50 cent piece of duct tape, threw it over that crack, and solved what? Saved what? Tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of health care costs? We can't do that now because we're not positioned to do it. And if we can go to Mars, I would hope we can help 16 kids stay out of the ER for one more night so they can have a good day at school tomorrow and their parents can go to work and they can be productive. That's the goal and that's where I think our opportunity lies. Thank you. Well, you know, I always talk about the fact that in public health we're, we're very good. We um, um, talk to ourselves, listen to ourselves, and then sometimes we answer our own questions. And then we call that collaboration. You know, what, what can we do, um, let me start with Brian this time, what can we do to, to, um, um, to work with some high priority, non-traditional partners who really want to begin to try to improve health? So I think we, we, we know this answer, right? We've talked about this a lot, about we have to engage business, we have to engage you know, policymakers. I, I want to just give a little different spin on this, that, that everyone has one of two roles. Either, either health is central to your mission or you are supportive of health in your community. Transportation is supportive of health in your community. Every business, health is central to your mission because if you do not have a workforce that comes to work and is healthy, you have a bit of a challenge on your hand. There are not tax breaks big enough to offset 40, 50, 60 percent of your workers with diabetes or chronic heart disease. It's just not there. So we need to be thoughtful in engaging chambers of commerce, in teaching people where, they're, where they are in this health spectrum. You're either health is central to your, your business and your success, or you're supportive. And until we can look at a community and just absolutely put people in one of those two columns, uh, then we haven't completely done our job. Because everyone has to understand that health is not someone else's responsibility. It's not the public health department. It's not your provider. It's all of our responsibility. And we all have a, have a role to play. And you know, moving to, the, to an idea of, while we often look at, well, we're going to reduce diabetes prevalence by 7%, or we're going to reduce hypertension by 10%. What about we're going to have 100% of the businesses in our community with a certified uh, employee wellness program? 
What if that's our measure? What if we start to move not to the silos of disease, but to the heart of social determinants of health and finding measures and strategies and engaging all of our partners to say, how do you help us reduce the social determinants of health? Because it's not about being you know, the, the do-gooder, granola, crunchy public health people. This is about hardcore dollars. This is about having you know, better housing costs. This is about real estate going up because you're healthy. This is about bringing business to your community. This is about better schools. This is about improving your community by improving the basic cornerstone of health in your community. If you're not healthy, if your community's not healthy, your economy can't be healthy, your lifestyle can't be healthy, and no one will want to live there. But if we can turn that, if we can turn that curve and show there are opportunities to be healthy in our community, that our workforce is strong, then we will attract business and we will really allow people to, to achieve that American dream that, that Dr. Coe talked about. But if you don't have health, if you can't get out of bed, if you can't afford your medicine, um, it's just almost impossible. To, to get there. So it's really, you know, and, and I think CVS Caremark did a great job of saying like, hey, I guess we're here either, we're health is central to our mission or we're supportive of health. We're gonna be health is central to our mission. We gotta stop selling this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Cause we're poisoning our community. So they've made a choice and it's a choice that, that I applaud. Now, the question is for everybody else, what are you prepared to do to either support health in your community or make it central to your mission? Excellent answer. Um, I, I would add, uh, I mean, we, we use this term increasingly now, health in all policies. Uh, it's, it's a buzzword now in public health. And, and what it means, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is the notion that uh, uh, in many policy spaces outside of traditional health domains, be it uh, education, housing, transportation, the environment, and so forth, policymakers need to be thinking about the health implications. Um, and uh, some of the more forward-leaning uh, uh, governmental entities uh, commission health impact assessments uh, before they undertake uh, particular policy decisions to try to, to project what are the potential health implications of, of the different choices before them. Um, I think the, the way forward with this, though, is really going beyond this notion of health and all policies to really think about the win-win of alignment of interest. And I, I think it's, it's more or less what we just said, um, is finding out those sweet spots where uh, strategies that are going to be beneficial in terms of public health are also beneficial to the business or the healthcare system. Let me give you one example, Camden, New Jersey, where the uh, health system was struggling to deal with the common problem of ER utilization and, and uh, overutilization of the emergency room by, by uh, people who uh, are, are high utilizers of, of health care. And they had undertaken the traditional strategies for trying to decrease ER utilization and they had sort of an incremental effect. But you know what turned out to have the biggest impact? was putting services in place to help the patients with unstable housing. So solving the housing problem turned out to be a win-win, both for the patients who, whose housing needs were uh, being addressed, but also for the healthcare system. So that's why you see examples around the country where health systems now are investing in the community, investing in promised neighborhoods, educational initiatives, and so forth, uh, because they've done the math and they figured out that it's in their interest to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, so are businesses. I'd call your attention to the work of the Federal Reserve Board in San Francisco. This is the financial community that is now increasingly interested in investments in communities, uh, what's called collective impact, uh, as a way of uh, improving health outcomes through clever financial instruments. Uh, social impact bonds and other kinds of fina financing mechanisms where investors are being drawn to the idea of investing in the community in ways that improve uh, economic conditions and also improve health outcomes. Thank you. You know, the, the, at the end of the day, I guess the question is, um, how do we know things are getting better? So how would you measure, how do, how do we measure health impact? Steve. Well, um, as a physician and public health uh, professional, my instincts are to say that we uh, measure health impact by measuring health outcomes. 
that sounds pretty obvious uh, that we want to be looking at uh, measures of uh, life expectancy, um, quality of life, and the frequency of, uh, of serious diseases like diabetes and heart disease. Um, but it, that's actually a very challenging issue. Um, and what many people end up doing instead uh, is measuring process measures uh, and saying that if we uh, make progress with those, we must be making a difference and, uh, and that's a mark of success. But I think we really have to work toward improving population health outcomes. And the opportunity in doing that correctly um, is very much what was just said regarding the ability to integrate our data sets so that we have population health data, uh, not just data from my EMR or your EMR, um, but data that merges uh, what's available to health systems through health information exchanges, which is the, the new modality that's come out of the Affordable Care Act, integrate that with public health data, geospatial data that's increasingly available. Uh, we're carrying around data on our smartphones and other places that, that can potentially integrate with this. Environmental data so we know uh, uh, what's going on in terms of air pollution and uh, other sources of environmental stress. Um, census data and, and other information. You can get on Google and look up a bakery that you want to go to and immediately what pops up is a map showing you what's around there and, and all the local data. I as a physician can see a patient and I'm totally blind to this. The technology should exist for me to know that Ms. Johnson lives in a neighborhood that is a food desert. She doesn't have access to supermarkets. There's no green space around for Johnny to play. So my counseling about what to do about Johnny's overweight status needs to take those neighborhood contextual factors into consideration. So having those, uh, a big data infrastructure for us to measure improvements in health outcomes at the local level and at the obviously state and national level, I think is going to be vitally important uh, in, in uh, uh, monitoring our progress in dealing with health outcomes. The other important thing is economic data. Uh, most policymakers and others are pushing back on strategies like this with the question, will it save money? Um, what's the projected savings? And uh, for most of my career, I've been arguing that that's the wrong question. We, we, don't, we don't ask when it comes to treatment of disease, will it save money? So if somebody has cancer we and we're trying to decide whether to put them on chemotherapy, we don't ask, will it save money? Um, when we decide we want to send the space shuttle up or go to Mars, we don't ask whether that will save money. We as a society make choices that we think offer good value. So just as, as in the grocery store, we say that we are saving money at the grocery store by getting a good value on our dollar, the same must be true for health, that the amount of health benefit that we get per dollar needs to be maximized. That's how we control uh, spending in health care. And in that respect, we need to collect data that documents the economic value of our investments in public health and prevention. Um, because that research will show to businesses, to government, and so forth, that the return on investment really exceeds some of the wasteful spending that currently uh, is, is consumed by our less efficient healthcare industry. So I think ditto is probably too succinct an answer. So I'll, I'll try to expand on that a little bit. Um, when we think about public health, we are often wed to our quantitative data. But health is also something that you know it when you feel it, you know it when you get it. And so having an avenue of strong qualitative data is e extremely important. And I will um, mention the, the Title V Maternal Child Health Services Block Grant. Every five years, um, you have to prepare a needs assessment as part of your Title V funding. And I was a former Title V director in Georgia, so this was, I, I think I've completed two or three of these in my life. And so um, it's a pretty heavy lift. And part of it is doing qualitative interviews with people around the state. And even though, and I remember this distinctly from Georgia, even though obesity might have been our primary issue at the state health department, it was not the primary issue for people um, living in the state. Those were issues much more about access to care and community, uh, community strength and uh, community safety. And so, you know, working with your community, make sure that their voice is heard because their voice is not always crystal clear through the data. I think it's also important when we think about measuring health not to continue to measure only our individual silos of disease. If we agree that heart disease and diabetes and hypertension all kind of 
you know, have a foundation in the social determinants of health, why don't we design interventions that go at the social determinants of health and measure our impact there? And I mean, that's a, that's a, a kind of a shift from the way that we usually do public health, which is what is our, it's, it's all of these, you know, I was looking at the plan for a healthy Chicago last night, and you could put in anything, plan for healthy Baltimore, plan for a healthy X. And it's this litany of YRBS and BRIFIS measures and, you know, data that's available to us. But we need to be a little more thoughtful. If we're really going to measure health, how we do it in our communities, and we all need to work together to, to access data. Like, I'm sure I could ask any of you all to pull out your keys right now, and you have a little swipe tag for your grocery store, right? Does anyone not have that? Because you're, you're not saving money then. You should get it. <laughs> uh, it's useful. But it's also a bunch of data, right? I mean, what a great way to, to, if we really wanted to do a nutrition intervention in our community, work with our supermarket partners to figure out, did it make any changes in, in how people consumed you know, food at the grocery store? Um, another place to get height and weight data is your, your motor, vehicle motor vehicle department, your MVA, um, your DMV, or whatever you call it in the state. But you know, how, do we then, how do we use DMV and have partnerships with them to measure health impact in our community? You know, would they be willing to put another question on the, I mean, we, we all, we don't care, we need to get a license, so we're going to answer the questions that are put in front of us. But you could have some optional questions there that, that measure health. Could the business community get together and do a survey amongst um, its group, you know, its employees? The day, and, and this will be, you know, this could be controversial, but why not? Um, the day of the, the survey era in public health is coming to an end, right? Telephone surveys are not the way we're going to keep doing it. And we can stay very much attached to this and, and attached to making, you know, phone calls and, and you're saying that, you know, uh, data that comes out of a random digit dial survey is better than some of these other less clean, not publishable data. Well, last time I checked, Briffis had like a 30% response rate. And if you go to Smart Briffis, which is something to give you um, a little more precision uh, the smart Briffis data for Washington, D.C. includes four states, if you count D.C. as you know, three states in a commonwealth. So it's D.C., Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia. That's not precision. I can't do anything with that. So before we figure out how we measure our health impact, the question is how are we going to get the right health data? And, and the bar is not publishing anymore, right? The bar is not... You know, we have these origins in, in academic medicine and in publishing and you know, putting stuff in the peer-reviewed literature. But you know, my governor needs an answer today. He's not really going to wait for peer review. And if you say that, you will not have a job. That's when the guy comes with the box and you're out the door. You know, governor, it hasn't gone through peer review. Um, not a good idea. So you know, what, are, what are the data sources that are available to us or that we can leverage so that we can make real changes and real action in measuring our health impact. Um, there was a project, I want to say it was in New York, where they gave um, a, an, an electronic medical record to every church in a certain area so that they couldn't, you know, so folks would do blood pressure screenings, but then write it on a card. Mm -hmm. Well, and they would find folks who, like, seriously needed intervention, but it was written on a card. But if you, if you, give, that, if you give that same group a little, Excel spreadsheet, a database, and then work with a local primary care provider, you can actually get those folks care. And that's measuring health impact. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my perspective, just on top of the absolutely everything that, that Steve said. Well, you know, each and every year we, of course, have uh, National Public Health Week, and each and every year um, we, we celebrate um, what's going on. And each and every year after that, we do it again. Um, one of the things we want to do is we want to really begin to uh, take this conversation to another level. Um, and um, as you heard Dr. Cole uh, say, the idea of uh, being the healthiest nation in a generation. Um, so what's the best way for us to continue this conversation um, as building a movement um, after National Public Health Week? Um, so, of course, it would, we can keep the conversation at the Practical Playbook website, which is www.practicalplaybook.org. And there are the success stories there, and each, with each success story is the actual contact information for the folks who contributed the, the case study, the success story. So you can actually reach out to those folks, and that's a way to continue the conversation. 
Um, I think the conversation is, is, going, um, is ongoing on Twitter. I, I am a new Twitter convert, so I didn't like it, get it, I made fun of it. And my wife is just chuckling now that I am tweeting all, tweeting all the time. And um, so I mean, I, there's at Prac Playbook, which is the Practical Playbook's Twitter handle. My Twitter handle is at Brian C. Castrucci. Um, APHA does some great tweets on this topic. Asto, um, Nacho, uh, Amchip, just all of our partners who are just trying to keep this conversation going. And as a, if you're not on Twitter, I will give the endorsement that I have found in the last month that I've been on it so much health information that I can just directly access to know what other people are doing. It's incredible. Um, but as much as we need a conversation, we, we need some action. We need to do. We need to get local leaders to really align. And this is where this is going to start. This isn't going to be congressional fiat. We're not going to wait for an executive order. Um, this is about community action back at the, the heart of it, right? So, so there are primary care folk and there are public health folk in a community right now and they both are frustrated by something. They have some common motivator and we need to get them together and say, okay, if asthma is our problem or if obesity is our problem or if motor vehicle accidents are our problem, let's figure out what our problem is by using our data and then let's figure out how we, can, how we really can take this problem down together. And until that conversation starts, you know, that's, we're, we're going to have a real challenge in moving our health status forward. So you know, my challenge to, to the folks here, to the folks listening in Cyberland, is to build upon this conversation today and in the next 30 days really try to meet with your health care or public health partner. Just one step in the next 30 days. How many meetings can we really accomplish? How could we start the transformation? Because this isn't a simple thing. This isn't going to be a stroke of a pen to change our healthcare system. If you've never read Paul Starr's Social Transformation of American Medicine, go read it and then figure out how that applies to today because we need another transformation. This one includes public health. This one will help us really achieve um, health for all of our communities. And it's going to start with a conversation. So, Easiest thing, how do you continue a conversation? Pick up the phone, send an email, but do it in the next 30 days so we can capitalize on the momentum that we have today. Because if it doesn't start now, it won't start tomorrow. Ditto. <laughs> I, think, I think public health has an opportunity um, to act as a catalyst for change, um, but I think it really requires a, a bit of a change in our image. Um, I, I think obviously governmental public health is, is uh, in our backbones, but uh, given the kinds of topics we've been covering, it's clear that where the real opportunity for change is going to come is in these sectors that don't really think about themselves as, as part of the public health industry or part of, part of that movement. Um, after National Public Health Week uh, is over um, and the public's mindset turns to other topics, uh, there is an opportunity to keep the conversation going by drawing a connection between those other topics and public health. So uh, an example, and I'll, I'll do some advertising here, uh, the Education and Health Initiative uh, is, is something that uh, we're involved with uh, through funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And uh, we find it very challenging to reach out, but also actually very uh, uh, successful to reach out to our colleagues in the education reform field who are working on issues like how do we uh, promote early childhood education, how do we improve uh, children's performance in schools and their grades, how do we deal with high school graduation rates and making college more affordable and say, oh, by the way, if you do that, we're actually going to improve health outcomes, extend the life expectancy of these kids, and as they become workers, have more productive workers and a lower health care costs. And the response is, absolutely, that definitely needs to be part of the conversation. So we're in an election year. Um, we're going to be talking about income inequality. Uh, our politicians who are campaigning are trying to embrace that issue on both sides of the aisle. We're concerned about unemployment, the economy, uh, creating jobs. These are all front page issues. It's not like they lack attention. But the public health community can get in that space and say, these 
policy decisions have health implications. They were help, help control the prevalence of diabetes and other major chronic diseases, and they'll help us control health care costs if we make smart choices around those. Um, I again want to come back to this issue of uh, community development because I, I think there's a real opportunity there for the public health community to find a win-win where we can help communities and, and get part, uh, engage ourselves in the conversation between developers, uh, municipal officials, financial uh, investors, and others who are looking at strategies in economic development and these promised neighborhoods and uh, empowerment zones and so forth that will improve health outcomes at the same time that they improve economic conditions, help address poverty, reduce income inequality, uh, and improve the economic vitality of our communities. That field is moving forward, um, and I think public health uh, should be at the table. Well, thank you. Let me um, open it up now for Q&A. I know we have Q&A in the floor here, and then we have some folks uh, on Twitter. Um, let's wait for the mics. We have the question over here um, in the front row. Bob Griss with the Institute of Social Medicine and Community Health. This is a very exciting discussion. I really like the format where each speaker is trying to outdo the other in a creative way in selling public health. I don't recall experiencing the celebration of this week in that way before, and I uh, heartily uh, support it. On the other hand, um, the Ethic in our community is really competition, and people are concerned about the impact on themselves, uh, the, the savings to their, their bottom line, their family. We don't have a collective, uh, there's, we don't have a natural, well, it may be a natural, but we don't have a, an institutional wiring for the commons, for the collective identity. Uh, from an, from a, uh, uh, an actuarial point of view, you can look at a geographical area and say this is a community, but does that community see itself as a community? I, I, there are some examples of this. Uh, Rochester was my favorite example uh, a, a long time ago, but it, it too has changed uh, in terms of the institutional framework. I'm wondering, while I, I like the technological examples of linking data sets in ways that could demonstrate um, the benefit of sharing, of sharing uh, data with health impacts, I'm not sure how one builds an institutional framework that reinforces our collective identity. And I would like to hear some examples of communities that have done that and have raised the visibility of the collective benefit or suggest even a process strategy for, for doing it. Um, is that clear enough? Yeah, thank you. Let, let me start by saying, you know, we, um, we've been trying to do this at least begin this framework for a few years. So APHA and United Health Foundation um, puts out every year a, um, um, a ranking on the states where we um, try to show where the states are in terms of the healthiest states. Um, and we do that in a couple ways. One, by ranking the states, and in addition, by pointing out that even the states that don't rank as well as the other states um, have things they do well and things they don't do so well, and then try to get them to focus on those things they don't do so well. Um, in a collaborative way. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, of course, through their state health rankings, and they just recently rolled, I mean, the county health rankings, and they just recently rolled those out the last, in the last couple of weeks. Um, again, to, to make the point that even within an individual state, that there are some counties that are um, healthier than other counties, uh, and those rankings in both of those situations include uh, things that are not necessarily focused on health. So, for example, in the state health rankings, we have high school graduation as one of the, one of the measures. Um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has gone further um, through their Roadmaps to Health Award program. And that program, um, they actually give cash awards um, to communities 
that are multidisciplinary and are engaged in trying to build that sense of collective commons that you talked about to improve their health. Um, and what they've discovered is not only do those communities improve their health, um, but they've had a couple examples where the communities have actually improved the economic well-being um, um, when they've had a, a plant closed to try to get people jobs so that they've been able to show that the, the commons, the collective working together in a community um, can approve a lot of things, um, bringing down crime, um, improving the health, improving the, the livability of communities. Uh, so I think this concept um, that both Steve and Brian have talked about uh, is there. And I think at the end of the day, in order for us to be the healthiest nation, we're going to have to do exactly that. Um, we're going to have to not only get people to be focused on individual health, uh, but they're going to also have to reach out and talk about the health of their communities proactively um, before the hurricane or tornado hits. I, uh, uh, I think, Bob, that uh, uh, there are modern-day versions of what you're talking about that are extremely encouraging. I mentioned it earlier, this notion of collective impact. You should Google the term because this is uh, uh, increasingly an effort in, in communities around the country for uh, consortiums and coalitions to form uh, of different sectors in the community so that the community itself becomes invested in doing something about a particular health condition. A as a primary care physician, I used to think it was progressive for me to talk about partnerships with, with between primary care and the community. So for example, in dealing with obesity, rather than me just counseling my patients that they should eat more fresh produce and, and exercise regularly, uh, but not offer any kind of intensive counseling to help them with uh, what is a very difficult change in lifestyle, to partner with commercial weight loss or YMCAs or public health uh, departments so that we work together to help uh, uh, overweight patients deal with their obesity. But any serious student of, of this topic realizes that uh, our problems with caloric balance have to do with a wide variety of issues beyond what a doctor tells you or what you hear about at a, at a counseling class. It's what's at the supermarket, it's what, what's on the menu at the restaurants, it's what's on the cafeteria tray at, at, at the children's schools, and so forth. So a, a community's serious effort to deal with obesity has to involve a multi-sector collaboration between all of those obesity players uh, who all work together in a coordinated fashion to come up with a healthy Chicago or, or a, a healthy community. Uh, and, and we see these popping up all around the country. And that's what these financer, financial folks are investing in. Um, and again, I think those kinds of collaborations are a win-win in terms of improving health outcomes, but also dealing with social determinants like economic conditions and other factors that we know are so important. I don't think anything catalyzes a community faster than seeing that from going from Metro Stop A to Metro Stop B, you lose seven years in life expectancy. You need to get this down to the community level. Um, anybody ever been to Atlanta? If I said, the health in Atlanta is good, where would that be? Which Atlanta? You mean the Buckhead Atlanta? You mean the East Atlanta Village? Where do you mean? Because it's a big city, right, with a lot of, but we want to know about it in your neighborhood. You want to know about how is health where I am. And we need to make a transition to, to, in understanding that I cannot live in a community and say I am healthy when my neighbor is sick. Mm -hmm. that, that there is a limiting factor that my community has on my health, because I could be even healthier if I lived in a community where everyone was healthy. And it, and it is, it's a, it's, it gets back to public health's roots in community organizing and getting us back to being you know, community advocates. Um, and it's going to take everybody. This, this is not gonna be just done on, in and on the backs of the communities where the life expectancy is low. But it's easy to live in, in Northwest DC and, and live in a $5 million house and say, my health is great, why do I worry? You worry because the people that you employ who let you get that $5 million house actually live in places where they're, they're not very healthy. And so you're not getting the maximum output for that worker and that worker is not being able to you know, enjoy their lives. And, and this is detrimental to all of us in a social contract to actually be a community. And it all sounds kind of you know, mushy, no, not outcomes based, but sometimes mushy works.
Sam Cooper again. Um, I applaud the APHA and all of the presenters for broadening the discussion of public health. Um, public health really involves one community, and that's the community of the population of the United States. Um, several years ago, uh, we began to recognize that in addressing high-impact issues in, in a foreign countries, and say a country in Africa, I'll use this example, with a 2.6 million population, was one of the most AIDS-ravaged populations in the world, was uh, um, given close to a half a billion dollars over the past decade and a half uh, by major foundations, every major one here in the U.S. contributed the U.K., and they were able to level off the HIV infection um, and, and to uh, halt uh, the, death, the rise of the death rate. However, the average age of death in the population hasn't changed much. And the reason for that was that people, the people who didn't have AIDS had no access to primary health care. If you went into a, one of the clinics, you had to be HIV positive or have AIDS in order to get basic health care. And um, many of the population are dying from malnutrition. They're dying from sepsis. They're dying for other types of, of issues. And I think that we're only now beginning to recognize that actually we have a similar problem here, too. An overabundance of, of duplication in some areas and an underabundance of uh, uh, direct support in some other ones. Um, I, I don't know how we get to a, a collective community. I mean, in the, in the words of uh, the great American philosopher Richard Pryor, this ain't no community, this is a neighborhood. Because several of those neighborhoods have competing interests. And um, to get a collective out of the broad range of neighborhoods that we have uh, is, is a rather difficult situation. I'd like you to address that, your ideas on that. Well, you know, it, it is true that we have numerous communities in the United States that are extraordinarily challenged. Um, I, I find it interesting that the, um, again, we talked about this county kind of health rankings we do every year, and that several of the states have remained at the bottom. Um, interestingly enough, they correlate pretty strongly with those states that are not expanding under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and they can make an enormous difference on the health and survivability of their population um, by providing them health care. Um, lots of excuses as to why they don't do that, and we can probably debate that on another day. But, but those communities are also very much challenged with high degrees of poverty, high degrees of unemployment, a whole range of negative social determinants um, in those communities. And it, it's clear that we need to help them um, as a nation, um, and um, but it does start with, you know, one of the reasons we picked this theme, public health start here, is you got to start with something. Um, so I would argue, at least from my perspective, um, um, dealing with things like income inequality, a minimum wage would, um, um, would, would, would help that issue in terms of income inequality. Uh, making sure that we deal with the gender disparity in what men are paid um, and women are paid for jobs would, would help that because we have a growing challenge with income inequality. Um, making sure that everybody has in this, this country has um, access to affordable quality health care. Uh, the Affordable Care Act as designed, while not necessarily the model that I would have drawn, um, is probably the best model we're going to get if we're going to maintain the system that we got. And, um, but we won't know anything unless we get a system with everybody in and nobody out. So I've argued that those are some things that we clearly need to do. Uh, and then there's a whole range of, of things that, that we know um, are going to make a big difference uh, in the lives of, of our nation. You know, addressing our infrastructure problems, um, dealing with climate change. Um, and um, um, if you don't like the term climate change, then we can talk about, we can hide it in cloak by talking about air pollution and um, other um, things that we know um, um, we can address, but ultimately you know, address climate change. Um, so I think there's, there are many things that one can do around economics, et cetera. At the end of the day, if I could take every dollar we spend and spend it on education, 
um, at, and make sure that everybody um, had high quality education and they were able to graduate from high school um, and that we improved the high school graduation rates, that would make an enormous impact on outcomes. We know very clearly that um, the mother's educational level correlates very strongly with um, the child's ability to do better, including survival. Um, so there's a lot of things that we know, a lot of correlations that we know. Some of them are surrogates for other things, but um, that's where I would probably start. Um, education, income inequality, um, transportation, and the environment. So I want to turn the lens on ourselves for a second, because what Dr. Benjamin is talking about are, are great things and things we have to do. But how does the public health infrastructure, the governmental public health infrastructure, do any of those things? When we're busy competing against ourselves, right, we are as, we, we need a Rosetta Stone. We are like the Tower of Babel in public health, broken apart so that the, the 20 affiliates that ASTO has, you have a maternal child health group, and then a vaccine group, then an immunization group, and then an injury group, and all have their own individual CEOs and their own individual priorities. When I got to the foundation, I got a phone call, and someone said, you know, Brian, now that you're, you're, you used to be an MCH guy, so I wanted to call you and congratulate you on your new job. We need budget, we need budgeting for maternal child health people. I said, that's interesting. Then I got another call. It says, hey, Brian, you know, a friend of mine knows you. Um, yeah, we need funding to do budgeting for lab people. Okay, budgeting for lab people. Now, isn't it all budgeting? Right, so we need to find some collectiveness amongst ourselves in public health so that together we can, if we mobilize, because right now <clears throat> all public health really is is a wrapper around which we have all the individual federal funding streams. It was amazing to me when I got, what, there was an epiphany moment for me in Georgia. Um, where I was Title V and WIC director, and I, and I really thought, like, wait a second, do I report to the state health official, or do I report to the WIC regional person, or my, my HRSA Title V administrator? Who do I report to? Because the, my, my funding is up there with the Fed. So how do we mobilize ourselves? What if we had a strategic plan and money that allowed us to do it for public health? And, and I'm, I want to, you know, comment on a, on a project that we had, and it just was published in the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, and it's a, a paper on how we were breaking down the silos around public health training. It's a project that, that Lacey Fehrenbach worked, worked on with the foundation when she was at ASTO, Jim Pearsall, APHA was represented. We brought together 35 different national leadership groups in public health and said, what are your training needs? not your individual training, what are the training needs for public health? Because for a long time, and this is something that I'm working through, um, if you ask me what I did for a living, I tell you I'm an MCH guy. It's Title V director, I do MCH. I almost never would say I, I'm public health. Yeah, I almost would never, I, my identity was, was built from MCH, I got into AMCHIP early, I was a deputy in a, in, in a Title V program, I became a Title V director, that's what I did, I did MCH. And I wouldn't ever have thought to apply to an immunization job, ew, or apply to an even worse, infectious disease job, I was an MCH guy. But, you know, where is that allegiance? Is that allegiance to my individual practice or is my allegiance to, to the APHA and, and that identity as a, as a profession, not subdivided into small components of ourselves? And so I think that's an important, because the example you gave started out with the HIV money, right? Because the focus wasn't on the health of the community. The focus was on a specific disease. And as long as we keep doing that, we're going to have challenges. So a theme coming out of this exchange is, is the need to have a big picture perspective and not to be over-specialized. That's certainly true in the medical profession that uh, we, we get into these uh, very narrow specialties and that's entirely our worldview and your point is that uh, the same can be said of public health, but also how we approach uh, our, our policy decisions broadly as, as a country. Um, going back to the report I mentioned that compared the health of Americans with people in other high-income countries, um, I want to point out one other big distinction between our country and the other countries. Um, we might react to the list of ideas that Dr. Benjamin proposed by saying, well, we can't afford to do all that, um, that it, it's too expensive, we have uh, fiscal constraints, and uh, there's not money available. 
We have plenty of money. The uh, United States spends more on health care than any other uh, country in the world. Um, and if I had a slide to show you, it would be a, a slide that plots the percentage of our GDP going toward health care um, and the percentage of it going toward social services. And we're an outlier on that chart. Uh, you, you see the United States way out there on the right end of the chart. Uh, and anybody who wants to see this, I'm happy to email it to you. Um, we are out there with a very high proportion spent on health care, way more than any other country, both in per capita expenses and in obviously in aggregate. And over on the left-hand side is this whole cluster of all the other high-income countries spending uh, far less on uh, health care and much more of their GDP on social services. And guess what? They live longer. Uh, they have longer lives, their kids live longer, and they have lower disease rates and healthier workers. So we can continue to invest in the fragmented system. That's how we got to this spot that we're in. Or we can think about a transformation. Other questions? Bob again. I'm wondering if there really isn't an answer to this question that Steve is posing to us that we haven't really addressed yet. And it has to do with power, has to do with politics. It has to do with the things that actually do divide us. There's been a separation between medical care and public health for a long time. I'm not sure, even though we use new terms like population health, what are the infrastructures that are bridging this divide? And are there concrete examples of transferring, of, of capturing savings in medical care and redirecting it to public health? Camden is one example, but in a very narrow institutional framework of the Medicaid program. How do you do that at a community level? I mentioned Rochester before because when Kodak was in charge of the economy, the largest employer in the town, they had political and economic power. And they used that power to make sure that the healthcare system didn't explode in Rochester the way it did elsewhere. They invented community health planning. They invented certificate of need. In the 60s, they did this, and in the early 70s, this became part of our public health infrastructure, the National Health Resource Services Development Act. We actually had an infrastructure for national health planning. That got dismantled when Reagan came in, and the financing for it at the state levels were eliminated. My question is, how do we deal with the power structure that makes medical care an industry rather than an, a way of improving population health. Because if we're not all functioning from the same budget, aren't we just coming up with creative examples of how we could do the right thing if we wanted to? And sure, we have the money, but do we have, but we don't have the resources and the political will. That means we don't have the power. Where does the social movement come from? Do we need two weeks of National Public Health Week to get that? Well, let me let me let me say that I believe strongly that that the um, the mar that there are, there are, there's room for market forces um, in a variety of ways. Um, but we have a lot of perverse incentives, as you know, in the health system. Um, one of those is that we continue to pay for volume. Um, we don't necessarily pay for outcomes. So again, the Affordable Care Act um, picked up on a movement um, to um, begin to pay for performance. And I think that will be a, a way of getting people to focus more on quality so that every health system CEO isn't rewarded because their revenues for this um, year's growth is more than last year's growth. And that, as you know, continues to be a major driver of cost. Um, also, um, every, every community has to have the next best IT thing. You know, um, I remember um, I, I grew up in the CAT scan era 
Um, so, you know, I was actually practicing in the hospital, believe it or not, without a CAT scan. Um, and then, of course, watched through my medical career um, how the technology dramatically improved. And I know what we stopped doing, which was a good thing. Um, but everybody had to have the newest and greatest, you know, new scanner. Uh, I don't want to pick on CAT scans, but every piece of technology has, has gone through this, um, this process. I think that, but if we're going to do this, if we're going to move to quality outcomes, we have to have up front a, a conscious decision that we're going to reward the systems that have um, better performance in terms of outcomes with that, some of that money coming back for them to reinvest in prevention and wellness. Um, now, are there models that do that? Well, there, there are similar kinds of models where you have shared cost savings for reinvestment. So when I was a health officer in Maryland, um, we had lots of our kids with developmental disabilities primarily, some of the kids with mental illness, who are out of state in institutions. And as part of our drive to move those children not only back in the state, but also into the community, so we got them out of the institutions, um, and we knew that we did the, the economic modeling and knew that it was cheaper for us to bring them back in the community. But what we did was we basically cut a deal. The deal said, listen, when we, if, a, if a kid costs $100,000 in the institution and we can serve that kid for you know, $40,000 in the community, then the resulting savings there, some would go to the general fund and the rest would go into what we called at that time the Community Services Trust Fund which allowed us to reinvest in more children to go into the community. So it was a recognition that we could come up with a better model of providing services, that there would be a savings, and that that savings would be split between the state's needs for other things and to, to, serve, more, to serve more children. And I think we can do models like that around health with the idea that um, the save, some of the savings goes back for, for more and better clinical care services, and some of those dollars can come back uh, into prevention and wellness um, services in order for us to invest more into the, the prevention side. And I think that helps us, uh, as, as Steve said, there's a lot of money out there. And that helps us recycle the money, but it has to be defined and um, purp at a purposeful um, restructuring of the financing in order to make that happen. I, I, I wanted to say, Bob, that I, I grant you, uh, I, I think uh, I agree with your point, that that infrastructure is lacking. Um, I think a lot of thought is currently going toward how to build that. Um, and uh, one example I'll mention to you is the uh, Rethink Health initiative uh, that the Ripple Foundation is pursuing, which is actually modeling how you could take those savings and reinvest that. Um, into uh, social determinants of health and so forth. But your larger point of, of, of power interest, I think, is, is important. Um, and we're obviously not going to get anywhere until uh, those uh, special interests uh, see, again, as I've said before, a win-win in, in aligning around this. Uh, my prediction, perhaps na naive since I'm not a political scientist, is that we're going to have a clash of the titans. Um, we have a healthcare industry uh, that uh, in many ways benefits from the status quo. So many people think of, of uh, that aspect of corporate America as not really being motivated to see reallocation of resources under a different model. But the rest of corporate America is really feeling the burden uh, of these uh, much higher disease rates and health care costs. And I think we're going to reach a point where um, this, the, the special interests of the health care companies um, is offset by the overriding need of, of businesses generally in the United States to get some control over these health care costs and, and the uh, deteriorating health status of the American workforce. Um, and that, I think, both at the national level and at the local level, uh, is, is a potential force for change that uh, I, I find some hope in. When you talk about issues of power, you're, you're talking about such a, a large enemy. And, and you, you can't let the size of the enemy defeat you before the battle is waged. And there is nothing, I mean, revolution, taking up arms, 
brings immediate change. Transformation is going to take time. It's, I mean, for as, for as many years as we've been dealing with race issues in this country, are we perfect? Have we accomplished everything we've needed to? It's been a long battle. This is not going to be any different. This is going to be a long battle. Going back to, to you know, before Flexner, when you could hang a shingle and call yourself a medical school, would those folks back then have said, oh, someday, you know, medical schools are going to have a prominence and physicians are going to be, you know, highly respected. And it, it took transformation. It took change. And what we need to do is find a voice for that change and not allow it to just be kind of, you know, interspersed throughout, you know, our, our conversation. But a real how do we move, how do we keep this conversation going? How do we continue to bring up the people and highlight them when they have had success? Uh, because if we just go and start talking about money, we're going to lose our audience because we're going to look like we're making a power grab and a money grab. Um, we're going to have to demonstrate to, to the folks who have the power that we are worth investing in. Um, if you ever watch Shark Tank, um, I have two small kids, so I don't go out much on Friday night, so I watch Shark Tank. And it's people who are making presentations to, cap to venture capitalists about their idea. Well, we almost need to do that same thing to those in power. What is the value of public health? Because ultimately, if you can say, look, you're going to invest $10 in this program, and it's going to save you $40 in health care costs. No one's going to not do that, right? I mean, no business person says, OK, I give you 10, you give me 30 back. No, I don't want to do that with you. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But we're going to have to demonstrate that very clearly with strong science that if we take a community health approach, that we can save money and, and yield a strong return on investment. That's why the work that APHA is doing on return on investment is so important. Um, and yes, some of it is going to have to be a leap of faith because it's not clear how, many, you know, how much disease you're going to prevent. You know, prevention is very hard to measure. The IOM, IOM's report on valuing prevention demonstrated just how difficult it is to find a framework to, value, to, to measure prevention. But we need to keep at it because otherwise, I mean, I, you know, my greatest fear in life is that a hospital is going to say, you know, listen, I'm just going to hire some health educators and an epi, and I don't ever have to talk to public health. I'll do it myself. And we're going to have, like, all these little public health departments based in hospitals, and they're going to have like a chief public health officer in the hospital, and then we're going to have all these little silos of public health. And to me, you know, and, and I don't mean to be hyperbolistic, but I see the asteroid, and I'm just kind of wondering, are we going to do the same thing the dinosaurs did, or are we going to do something different? And that, to me, is where public health is. You know, the, the hospitals have a lot of money in play, and they could, they could hire us out of existence. And that's my concern. And we'll duplicate, and we'll never get to population health. We might get to panel health. You know, we'll never have a community again, because I don't know that any people who all have Blue Cross Blue Shield are in the, I'm part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield community. I don't think that's a defining thing amongst us. Um, but that's the fear. And it could happen if we, don't, if we don't get proactive and start saying, listen, you guys each have a slice of this community. People are crossing in, in between your practices and your health insurance, the only kind of foundational group who can be the third party convener who can care for this community is public health. And if we don't make that argument and make it loud and make it aggressively, I just worry about where we're going to be. And just to add, uh, the course of public health departments at the state and local level are the only organizations that have the, actually the legal and statutory responsibility to actually do that. Um, and while there may very well be um, private entities that may um, feel that they have capacity to do that and they may do great work. Uh, at the end of the day, they, there are many things legally they just cannot do. Um, antitrust things get in the way, legal authorities get in the way. Um, and I just, my experience in public health, and I know Brian's, because we've talked about this uh, off, off, you know, um, offline a lot, is that. Um, at the end of the day, they got to pick up the phone and call you. The challenge is, is how far they've gotten in trouble before they call you. And so, um, and then, the, and then we have to have the capacity as a governmental public health, you know, community um, to um, to be able to help. And that is a capacity issue. Um, and I think one that um, we need to we need to point out. I also you know, remind everyone who thinks that at the end of the day, when we get everyone an insurance card, 
Um, we're still going to need a very robust, sustainable um, um, governmental public health system um, and a non-governmental public health system to support the uh, medical care system. And if you put all that together, we would hopefully call that a health system. Um, and, that's, and that's what I think we're all trying to achieve. It's nonpartisan. Um, disease, um, disasters, um, challenges in, in life don't have political parties. Um, so it, it is something that we need to make sure that we can deal with both sides um, of our formal political parties um, crossing the political aisles, as well as um, dealing with all the other parties that are that are developing, and um, and we need to do this in a, a data-driven, science-based way, respecting everybody's rights. I understand democracy isn't it's messy, um, but it does work. Um, but that means we have to listen to each other, engage each other, um, and try to solve problems um, uh, before those problems develop. Is so there any other questions out there before I close? I'll, one here and then here, these last two questions. Hi. Um, uh, this gentleman's point made me think of a point. Um, so I'm a recent, well, I recently graduated with my master's in health policy and administration in 2012. And I started working. And once I started working, I did see the distinction between uh, the medical, clinical, health care versus public health. And um, during my education, I could see that distinction. But now working, I'm like, uh, where do I go? So I'm in public health, and I have loans to pay back. And I'm, I'm like, oh, maybe I want to move over to more of a health care sort of position, because that will offer me more security than maybe what I'm getting in public health positions. And so my concern is that recent graduates and people at the beginning of their career like me are seeing this distinction and lost or confused and feeling like, well, who do I talk to? Do I go to public health people and say, hey, what should I do? Or do I go to more healthcare oriented people? What, it, it, it's a little bit confusing and I, I just wanted to hear some thoughts or suggestions or advice you could offer to people such as myself who are at the very beginning of their career in this position. So, uh, interestingly, we have some data that are, that's being presented at Keeneland probably right now that showed that in 1992 there were 700 undergraduate degree conferrals in public health. Today, in 2012, there were about 6,700. That's a huge growth in the undergraduate public health degree. And we are more and more people are coming to public health because it is not necessarily to say go work in a health department. It's to say how do you bring your unique perspective and your skill set, which is unique to you, um, to health care, to law, to a health, public health department. The distinction that I think is important in talking about integration and systems transformation is we are not talking about integrating the concept of public health. I always get a little prickly when I hear, well, we're, we'll just put one or two public health courses in the medical school curriculum and, and there we go. We've, we've done integration. Um, you know, I, I, it's my profession. It's what I do for a living. And I think it's more than just one or two classes. Um, so this skill set that you have, you know, make sure that regardless of where you go, you hold true to the principles of community health and why you got into the business to begin with. Because whether you're, a, whether you're a physician, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a public health practitioner, you got into the business to help people, right? Because you believed that, that you wanted a life where, where you were in service to others to make the community better. That's why we got into this. There are probably other jobs that pay better with, with better hours and less danger and you know less, less confusion. Uh, but we got into this for a reason. And so, yeah, it's going to be hard to say, well, gee, I could make more money over here in healthcare. And, that'd be, and, and you'll go into healthcare, but go into healthcare and say, hey, I've noticed that we keep seeing people from Fifth and Elm who have, you know, diabetes. Does anybody, do we know what the other practices is doing, what's happening at Fifth and Elm? Maybe because you worked in a health department, you know who the local health commissioner is. And you'll give them a call. Say, hey, Steve. Remember me? I worked for you, and now I'm over in this healthcare, and you know my boss doesn't get it. So can we have a meeting? 
Maybe you'll be the change. Maybe you start the transformation. And that's just a way to think about it. I think with that, that's going to have to be the last question. Um, um, I regret there was at least a, a few more people in queue. Let me, let me that close out. Let me just thank our panelists um, for being here today. And just remind you that there are several other things happening this week. Um, if you go to um, um, nationalpublichealthweek.org, that's nphw.org, and go to the events page, you'll see the other events. Tomorrow, um, Leading Health Indicators on Wednesday, a um, public health Twitter chat on, um, in addition, a town hall on air pollution and public health. On Thursday, another webinar on food justice, obesity, and social determinants of health. And on Friday, we're going to close out with a Google Hangout on active transportation. With that, I want to thank you very much and have a wonder, wonderful public health week.